there's been some there's been a, a, a consistent theme to the Gita thus far in these first four chapters so we've got a battlefield situation uh, Howard do me a favor and close that door for me and uh, we've got Arjun our protagonist He's going to have to kill his family members, um, which is just a huge moral dilemma. You've got your beloved family members on one side, and you have doing what's right on the other side. You could imagine if your family members all became Nazis. It was just, it, it just, it's such a big dilemma. And he takes shelter of Krishna, and um, and Krishna starts off by explaining that you're not the body, which is a powerful piece of information. You should have had this sorted out beforehand. There's a lot of stuff you're doing unnecessarily as I'm trying to get class started. Um, It's a pretty big piece of information that you're not the body. And that turns into a whole discussion. Once you know you're not the body, then what do you do with that information? What do you do with that information when you know you're not the body, Howard? Um, you weren't listening, right? No, kind of like you were. Then you should be able to answer easily. I know you're smart, and so you must not have been listening, because the question was like, two plus two equals, and you're like, I was listening. You couldn't have been, because otherwise you'd know the answer is four. What's the answer to my question? What's my question? Let's start with that. What's my question? What, what do you do when you're not the Sorry. What is the, okay, you what fail. Sorry, not? sorry, fail. You can't, can't stumble that many times that quickly. What was my question, Bailey? Yeah, how does that impact your life? And obviously that's within the context of the Gita. You know the answer? It dramatically alters the direction of your life. That's true, but that, that wasn't my question. That was what I said before I asked my question. What happens when you know you're not the body? What do you do? You do your duty without being attached to the results, like Krishna's been beating the drum on for the last three chapters. The statement that it dramatically alters the course of your life is a generic statement. When I say, what do you then do? It's very clear I'm speaking of specifics and your reaction to that dramatic statement and how that statement dramatically changes your life by affecting your behavior. The very way I ask the question. Okay. Bailey, you're young enough where I'm going to give you a, a pass, but it was a, like an epic fail too. And in general, stumbling out the gate not the way to go. It's like if we're like, hey, let's run a sprint. And you're like, ah, and you fall on your face and rip your face. But oh, let me start again. It's like, sorry, the race is over. The race is over. If we're doing a sprint and you fall on your face and break your nose, there's no mulligan. It's, it's a sprint. Game's over. Everybody's already finished one. You're not the body. And then that changes the way you live in this world. It changes the way you live in this world by getting you to do your duty but not be so attached to the result. And there's a lot of conversation on this theme. What does that look like? Give me some analogies. If I have to choose between knowing or acting, which one's more important? What's this whole yagya thing? How does that play in? What if I've got material desires but I've learned I'm not the body? Can I still even with some material desires, practice this teaching? What if I'm not quite there yet? How about setting an example for others? When do I get to exit the game? Do I have to stay in the game? If I have to set an example for others, do I just give them the full, full teaching or do I give them a little bit at a time? What makes me not do the right thing even when I, I know what the right thing is? And that's the first three chapters of the Gita. And then we hit chapter four. 
and chapter 4 gets into why we should listen to Krishna. Why should we listen to Krishna? Everybody should know the answer to this if you've read the fourth chapter with me. You should all know. That's all I should have to ask if you guys should know the answer. Why should we listen to Krishna's teachings? Yeah? Because he's God. Now, it could also be because his teachings make sense. And they're logical and they're reasonable. So why is your answer, because he's God, more, more appropriate or more accurate than my answer? Because his teachings make sense. Yeah? Exactly. I, 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 I finished the first three chapters, and now I clarified I was discussing the fourth chapter. At the beginning of the fourth chapter, Krishna identifies himself as an authority because he's God. And so we're studying a text. We're not just talking. And so as we're discussing ideas, we're discussing ideas that are taught in the text. And so your answer is better than mine. Because although Krishna's ideas make good sense, irrespective of whether or not he's God. You know, you know, running with the Nazi theme, if you were to learn 2 plus 2 equals 4 in a Nazi arithmetic book, is it less true because it was written by a bunch of fascists? It's not. And so to some extent, independent of what Krishna's position is, you can simply look at the teachings of the Gita as great life lessons that are worthy of consideration because they make a lot of sense. But in the fourth chapter, Krishna does drop a pretty big bomb on us. He identifies himself as God. And that really changes things. We're now in a full-blown religious text. We're dealing with a theology. It's authoritative. It, it, it's a, it changes things. Within ethical theories, um, there's divine command theory, which is just a fancy way of saying God told me to, so it must be right. Divine command theory. So there's different ideas about what, you know, utilitarianism, what gets you the right result, that's what's right. And pragmatism, where you have a little bit more fluidity based on the specifics of a circumstance. Virtue ethics, where you want to cultivate something called virtue, which will help you figure out what you should do. Deontology, where there's the right way, and you should do that, and it doesn't really matter what the results are. It's an acts-based ethic. It's your act that's important, versus a results-based ethic. It's the results that's important. And then there's also crammed in there with these other major theories, there's divine command theory. Divine command theory is God says so, therefore it's true. Now, I don't think divine command theory by itself is a workable philosophy because if you try and free a theory from any necessity of accurately describing the world or making good arguments or being logical or reasonable, and you say, just because God said it, it's right? Well, then rape and murder could be justified automatically because if you get a religious text where God says that, then that's what you should do. And slavery was assumed in the religious texts of five billion people. Christianity, the Roman Empire, Islam, Judaism, they're all filled with slavery. Not the, exactly the horrific slavery that we have. The horrific, horrific slavery that exists in the United States up until 150 years ago was chattel slavery, where you owned a person as a piece of property and you could do anything you wanted to them. Like Theoretically, you could amputate the limbs off of a human being, but because you owned them as a slave, they, were no more, they had no more rights than a table did. In the same way you have rights to cut off the legs of a table, you could also cut off the legs of a slave and there would be no repercussions. In other ancient societies, it wasn't, necessarily, it wasn't always chattel slavery. Sometimes slaves had some limited form of rights and there were certain things you couldn't do and certain things would get you in trouble. 
it's bizarre, but 150 years ago in the U.S., we had some of the worst slavery in the history of the world that was more barbaric than some of the slavery that existed thousands of years prior. Do you know why we were so resistant to common sense in this country? Yeah, it was just money. There's too much money in the slave trade. Our whole country was built on it. You don't have to be a good businessman if you have free labor. It's just, it's such a low bar for success. Free labor or a monopoly. There's all sorts of things people do to just stack the deck in their favor. And it was tough for the U.S. to give this point up. Interestingly, you know how you tip uh, waiters, uh, servers at a, at, a, at, a, at a restaurant? That was post-Civil War. Um, black people worked on trains and they served meals. And the white train owners wouldn't pay the black people for working on the train and serving the food. So the customers would tip the freed slaves who were still working for no money. And the tips became how the freedmen made a living. Which is, a, is an interesting phenomenon because now essentially the servers are working for the customers. Which is a terrible business model for the restaurant owner because they're going to be loyal to the customer, they're going to give them free food, they're going to steal for them. They're going to, there's all sorts of things they're going to do to take care of the customers that give them tips and to ignore the customers that don't give them tips. And whereas the business owner would want to assure that there was a certain degree of uniformity and um, in the service they were offering to their customers, if you're not getting paid by the business owner, you're only getting paid by the customers, it, it's, it, it makes you loyal to those particular customers who give you the most money and it makes you totally disloyal to the business owner. You follow? That's where tipping comes from. Wild, right? They make those, I don't know what they call them, Pullman loaves. Pullman loaves. They're these sandwich loaves that are made to get you extra slices of bread and they don't, they don't round out. They're just straight in a box and so you just have to tight, cut off the tiniest little bit on each end and you have a viable slice. Whereas with a normal loaf of bread, these areas here are relatively unusable because they, they taper down. But the Pullman loaf, it's, it's, it's perfectly square. Have you seen those? And it was from a Pullman oven that was on trains and then they had to maximize the amount of sandwich bread they could make on the train so they invented this system of the Pullman loaves and that oven so it would fit completely in the oven and max out the amount of bread you could make and the amount of sandwiches you could make and that's where it came from. And so they even sell them now like for my restaurant I buy Pullman loaves. So anyway uh, Um, if you get into divine command theory and there's nothing tethering you to logic at all and it's just because God told you to you have the makings of an awful religion if you have a, an ethical system that makes sense the Gita has an acts based acts based ethic an action-based ethic, do the right thing, irrespective of the results, with some virtue ethics mixed in. You need to cultivate these qualities of virtue that will help you to navigate situations. So that's what it is. It's virtue and action-based ethics, not a results-based ethics, ever. 
Um, but if you then establish the validity of that ethical system, and then you add in, hey, this is spoken by God, there's a little less weight put on that statement that's spoken by God because you get to fall back on the idea that's reasonable and it makes sense. Then if you were to compare this divine, divinely commanded theory to another divinely commanded theory, and one divinely commanded theory squares with logic and reason, and the other divinely commanded theory does not square with logic and reason, then you've still got a way to do comparative religion, where you contrast one tradition to another. And you can decide which one's better. And it's not arbitrary. I don't think it's wrong. If, if God existed, there would be some elements of ethics. I mean, there, there was this whole statement that in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was Theos. That statement in the book of John, is, it, it was a, it was a, it's a meaningful statement. It's worthy of, of consideration. It's worth thinking about. That when something is logical, when something makes sense, when something is reasonable, when something squares with evidence, you're getting closer to divinity. We look at a world, we're in a world that, that's filled with rules and laws and physics. Laws of how matter interacts with itself. Laws of how chemicals interact with each other. And we can, we can um, we're made to see patterns. And in fact, patterns exist. Our brains are wired to see patterns. And in fact, patterns exist. And we can, we can spot them. And then we can, to a large extent, we can predict what will happen based on a thorough understanding of how matter interacts with itself. We can then look out into the world and we can understand. When we drop something, it's going to fall to the ground and how long it's going to take to slow down a car and domino effects and all sorts of stuff. We can figure out. We're, we're masters at recognizing patterns. So much so that our body, our mind needs to recognize patterns and that's what creates optical illusions is because there'll be something that breaks a pattern but your brain is so hardwired to see the pattern that you fill in the gaps and you don't notice what's actually on the piece of paper. You see the pattern that's suggested by the piece of paper and your mind blanks out and makes it impossible for you to see the actual thing on the paper. That's how much we're made to see patterns. Increases our survivability, means we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, in some theories, um, schizophrenia is, is based on, amongst other things, the inability to recognize patterns. So that you're always looking at the world anew and confused and it doesn't make sense because you're not able to recognize the patterns other people are able to recognize. Which gives you some fresh realizations, but also a serious handicap. The red team in, you know, in, in uh, in media circles, when you're investigating a story, and you run it by a red team, and the red team looks at it with fresh eyes, and then sees whether the story has validity or not, because they haven't gotten into a group think by researching the story. So when you send it to them, they'll see things and question it and scrutinize it in a way you won't, because you've all gotten into a group think. So you subject it to some. It's like as an underwriter, also, in business, you send things to an underwriter who objectively, as a third party, with a different set of criteria, with no interaction with the regular people in the business, then looks at things and makes a determination based solely on the criteria passed down from upper management and not because of any bias. In essence, that's what the jury of your peers is supposed to be also. They have to be sequestered. They can't know about the case. They can't have any biases which will predispose their, what, what their position will be. Um, so there is some benefit to looking at things anew but there's also tremendous benefit in recognizing patterns we're made for that 
And doesn't it make sense that if we live in a world filled with patterns where that increases your survivability, we're made to, per to, to, to perceive patterns, and patterns, in fact, do exist, and they're great predictors of what will happen, and you can look at stuff and how it relates to itself, to other stuff, and you can predict what will likely happen. There's an incredible degree of uh, um, accuracy in those predictions. And we live in a world filled with numbers and physics. Well, then the creator of that world would be a logical, rational, reasonable being because the world that he created followed that. And so looking at the world and then thinking about what that says about the creator of the world, we live in an extremely well-organized world. There must be a very well-organized mind and thought process behind the creation of the world if you accept that there's a creator. In which case, finding le le reason and logic is not antithetical to finding divinity. And divine command theory can go hand in hand with a, an action-based ethical theory with a little smattering of res uh, virtue on top of it. But by Krishna taking the trouble to flesh out his ideas independent of his divinity, we got a chance to engage with his line of thought logically and reasonably. And we became persuaded. And then when Krishna mentions he's God, it's just, it's just uh, icing on the cake. Have you guys follow that? That was some really good information I gave you. You should put that in your pocket and hold on to it for the rest of your life. A very, very valuable uh, reconciliation between divine command theory and the other major systems of ethics that doesn't leave divine command theory being idiotic or blind. Anyway, so Krishna introduces himself. He then explains um, the same ideas about being detached but doing your duty. He invokes again the Vedic Yajna in a metaphorical way. And then he surveys all of the different spiritual techniques which existed in ancient India, from controlled breathing to elaborate rituals, to study, to celibacy, to married life, to yoga, to different kinds of austerities for purification somebody might perform, to studying, to giving charity, et cetera, et cetera. He surveys a real, a, a, the entire landscape of Indian spiritual techniques which were utilized at that time and which were popular. And he is, is somewhat egalitarian in his approach. Actually, he's incredibly egalitarian. But not that any, so much so that anything goes. And Krishna makes a point that it's less about what you do and more about why you do it. And when you do something with the right attitude, it's more powerful than just doing the right thing. This is easy to understand. If someone gives charity to feed the poor, because they want to impress somebody else and get a favorable business deal. Is that as magnanimous as somebody who gives charity to help the poor just because? It is not. Also, that person who gives charity to help the poor just because will be more likely to do so in the future. Whereas a person who is doing it only to get advance their own career will not do so once they succeed or fail in their career and the whole thing is linked to their self-interest and that there's no real philanthropy there, although it might appear to be philanthropic. And one person would be a deep giver who would be much more likely to give again and again. The other person would be a shallow giver where it would be, be all about the form and, and not about the substance behind the form. Krishna makes essentially that point. He says the jnana maya yajna, the sacrifice of knowledge, within, within knowledge, composed of knowledge, comprised of knowledge, is greater than 
dravya maya yagya, just merely the sacrificing of possessions. And he tells you this is, this is important stuff to learn. He tells you to learn it from teachers. And that leads us to today's verse. And so here we go. Today's verse. 35. Yat yatva napunar moham evam yasya si pandava. Yat yatva. Having known this. Napunar moham eva yasyasi. You will not again go to illusion. You will not again go to illusion. Do you go to illusion or what do you do with illusion? Yasyasi means you will go. And so, but if I, you will go towards a building. What, what verb do you use to describe your relationship to illusion? You go to illusion? What do you do to illusion? You're under. You're under illusion. Okay, sure. I don't know if that's a... I guess, I guess it's a verb. It's being used as a verb, but it's a little, bit, a little bit weird. What verb describes your relationship to illusion? What do you do with illusion? Huh? No, because it says you will not again go to illusion. So you will not again dispel it as stupid. It doesn't work contextually. You fall into illusion. Don't you guys feel stupid? Isn't that what you do with illusion? You fall into illusion? You go to illusion? No, you fall into illusion, right? So you can take the word yasisi. Um, you will go and you can relate it to the word moham, illusion, and says you will not again go to illusion. And what Krishna is saying in English, if you translate it properly, he's saying you will not again go towards illusion. You will not again fall into illusion. You get it? Having known this, having known this, gyatva means having known. So from the same root that gyan comes from. Having known this. So having knowledge, you won't fall into illusion. Yena Bhutani Asheshana Asheshena Yena Bhutani Asheshani Drakshasi Atmani Atomai. And by knowing this, by this, you will see Drakshasi. You will see. What will you see? Bhutania Sheshani. All beings. You'll see all beings. Atmani. Within the self. Within yourself. Atomai. And also within me. You will see all beings within yourself and also within me. What does that mean? Let's come back to it. Don't think too much about it. We're going to think about it in a minute. Text 36. Apichet asi pape bhya sarve bhya papa kritta maha Even if you are the greatest doer of sin amongst all sinners, Papa, krit, means maker of sin. Tama means greatest. Even if you are the greatest maker of sin, the greatest sinner, sarva pape bhya, of all sinners. So we're talking about all sinners. We've got all the sinners, we stuck them in a room. And amongst all those sinners, you are, you're the greatest sinner of all those sinners. That's what it says. Apichet, even if that's the case. Some people are proud. Some people are proud. I'm the king of the hill. I'm the biggest sinner of the bunch. Would not be us. 
nor to be Krishna, nor to be anybody in the Indic spiritual circles. But if you were hanging out with a bunch of convicts and somebody was in, in prison for murder, then that gives you a certain degree of notoriety amongst convicts. Krishna's not using it like that. He's saying that being a sinful person is a deplorable state and being the greatest sinner amongst sinners is the most deplorable state. Sarvam jnana plavinaiva Vriginam santarishyasi All that vriginam, all that bentness, vriginam means crookedness, bentness, from bridge. Vriginam santarishyasi, you will cross beyond all of that crookedness. Jnana plavena, by the boat of jnan, by the boat of knowledge. It's uses a, uh, a metaphor by this boat of knowledge. Um, so you, you are almost left with the image that you're, you're drowning in an ocean. And you're drowning in the ocean more than anybody else is drowning in the ocean. You're in the deepest, darkest part of the ocean and you're drowning the most. And by the boat of knowledge, you will be carried across that ocean. You will not drown, and you will be carried to the other side. This is a, a very, very strong endorsement of the salvific uh, the ability to save, the ability to give salvation. This is a big endorsement of the salvific character of knowledge. That knowledge has a character, it has a, a, a function, it has an ability, it has a nature. And the nature of knowledge is such that it is uplifting. And it's salvific, it saves you. And it's transformational. And it's so transformational that irrespective of your starting place or what you did up until today, if you acquire proper knowledge, it will wash you clean from whatever dirt you've got on yourself. And it will convey you to the other side of the most formidable oceanic obstacles that you might be encountering. It's an endorsement. You know, the, the statement, know the truth, for it shall set you free. Biblical statement, carved into the walls of the CIA. There's this idea that knowledge is power, that knowledge changes you. And in spiritual circles, there's this idea that knowledge is therapeutic for the soul. It enlightens you. It's like if, if you learn music, you almost can't fall out of rhythm. You just, you learn how to move, you learn rhythm, you learn how to fight. You, uh, you know, I, uh, there's a famous athlete named Conor McGregor, um, very, very famous athlete. He was watching a fight and somebody threw something, a towel at his head. And he just naturally, as he was sitting there, or standing there, watching the fight, and he's talking and talking with his head, he naturally slipped to the side and the towel and went right past him. It's just, it's just natural. He, he slipped. He didn't like freak out and put his hands in front of him. He just naturally slipped the punch because the punch coming his way. He knows how to slip, so he slipped because it's, it's an economical movement. And so this happens. People get trained in how to do things, and they just, they naturally, 
know how to dunk or they know how to slip a punch or they know how to counter or they know how to shoot a shot or whatever it is they just it's it becomes muscle memory it becomes part of you it becomes unconscious expertise you move through a process of unconscious ignorance to conscious ignorance to conscious expertise to unconscious expertise till it just becomes part of who you are and what we're being told here is that knowledge isn't something you you learn while drinking brandy out of a sifter you know on a, while reclining on on your you know on your on your lazy boy smoking a cigar talking to other idiots it's not just this thing that you have like you might have a car or you might have a uh, a computer or something like that it's something that is viral or it infects you and it changes you like a superhero gets bit by a spider and then gets superhuman abilities it it changes you fundamentally it cyborgs you it makes you a better version of yourself it's transformational it's cathartic we don't oftentimes think of knowledge like that we think of knowledge as being much more passive something you have and you can deploy it or not but that's not what krishna's talking about here krishna's talking about a, a knowledge which is this powerful force in your life that changes you that purifies you that means that whatever you did in the past does not have to affect your future Do you guys follow this? It's interesting, right? So you're not defined by your past. it might start to limit your options it might start to color you it might start to jade you but there's always an option to transcend it that's never taken away and knowledge is this built-in escape hatch that we all have the ability to avail ourselves of where no matter how far down we've sunk we can be cured by a therapeutic dose of knowledge of realization i find this to be a fascinating idea just a fascinating idea let's read a couple more verses and then we'll go back and think about it more yataidang si samidho agnir bashma sat kurute arjuna just as a kindled flame re- uh, burns it, it makes a fire ashes <laughs> just as a kindled flame makes a fire into ashes now if you say a kindled flame makes firewood into ashes edangsi means firewood as just as a kindled flame samidho agnir kurute makes edangsi firewood bashma sat into ashes do you make firewood into ashes what do you do firewood to ashes you burn fire with the ashes we have another word in english that's more poetic what do you do you blank to ashes 
you reduce firewood to ashes. You never heard that before? It was reduced to ashes. It's like an educated thing. You have to have, like, you know, some kind of education. <laughs> the house was reduced to ashes. You, you never heard that before? The house was made into ashes? What did you, what did you guys say? Huh? Burn. The house was burned to ashes works, right? That works. Which one is more educated? The house was burned to ashes or the house was reduced to a mere pile of ashes? You get it? You see it? So if you, if you want, depending on how literal you want to be, you could say it makes fire, just as firewood is made into ashes by a kindled flame, or you could say just as firewood is reduced to ashes. And so the word kurute makes, it could be, it could be, it could be, uh, kri means to do. So then you have to like, you have to figure out what well, to do, like in what way to do. You get it? And so in Sanskrit they do this, they'll use a generic word like to do, uh, to go, and then you look at the word it's related to and you figure out what the appropriate way to render it is. Does that make sense? In that same exact way, the fire of knowledge reduces your karma to ashes. What a wild idea, right? And here, although karma usually means action, in this instance, the word karma must be rendered as action or reaction. The actions you perform are no longer, they no longer bind you, and the ones you performed in the past no longer bind you because you're able to get rid of all your previous sins. So both usages of action and reaction work with this verse. But usually karma just means action, and so in this instance it's very important to note that it would also refer to reactions as well, the burnt ashes. Yeah, what's up, man? I, I got it. Yeah, if you, I mean, you get some of it, but because the other person also has free will, they get some of it too. So if you are my father and you yell at me, then you get that bad karma for yelling at me. If I then turn into a colossal jerk because of your mistreatment of me, you get some of that. You get some of that. As I continue to make bad choices, I get a reaction from my bad choices. And you also share in that. You follow? You get a little, you get a little uh, residual income off of that. <laughs> Good question. I, this is fascinating, isn't it? Let's keep going. Nahi jnana sadrisham pavitram iha vidite. There is not to be found in this world anything equal to knowledge. No purifier equal to knowledge. There is no purifier equal to knowledge to be found in this world. Pavitram means purifier. Sadrasham, equal to. Jnanin, equal with knowledge. Iha vidite is to be found in this world. So much emphasis Krishna is putting on knowledge. Tat sarvam yoga sam siddha kale nat mani vindati. And having perfected that yoga oneself, you'll find that knowledge within yourself in due course of time. Kale na atmani. In time, in yourself. Vindati, he finds. What does he find? That knowledge within himself, having practiced yoga. So by the practice of yoga, by the practice of doing your duty without being attached to the results, by that practice, you'll eventually relish this purifying knowledge within yourself because it's within you already. This potential is within you already. And you activate it and you'll enjoy it in due course of time within yourself. All right, let's stop there for a second.
Yeah. I got it. Yeah. I'm going to keep talking. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk about what kind of knowledge is being spoken about. I gave a generic understanding by surveying the last four chapters of the Gita. And we're now going to use the same model that we used previously, which was we're going to look at generically what Krishna's referring to, and then we're going to see if there's any way that we can be more specific when defining what type of knowledge Krishna's talking about. I'll give you an example. Actually, I already gave you the example, because I'm just that good of a teacher, but you're not that good of a student. I already gave you the example. When I challenged you, what, was, what did Krishna do in the fourth chapter of the Gita to you know, validate the knowledge he was giving? And Sri said he taught he was God. And I said, but why wasn't it just based on the logic and the reasonability of it? And she said, because it was in the fourth chapter, and Krishna identified himself as God. And I made a point when we did that. I said that, in general, Krishna was logically and persuasively presenting information to us. But then you can look at a specific verse or a specific chapter and you can see that there's something extra being said by Krishna. And that gives you a more specific answer to the question of what was Krishna doing that was different in the fourth chapter than he's done anywhere else. Similarly, what is the knowledge Krishna's talking about? It's the knowledge he's been talking about the whole Gita. You're not the body, do your duty, don't be attached to the result, etc., etc. However, there was just a verse that we skipped over where Krishna said, Drakshasi, you will see everything, Atmani, within yourself, all beings. Sarvani, Bhutani, Sarvani, you'll see all, uh, Bhutani, Asheshani, all beings. Shesh means limit, Ashesh means no limit. Asheshani means Bhutani, all beings, without any limit. You'll see all beings, Drakshasi, you will eventually see them, uh, Atmani, within yourself. Atta mai, and also within me. And so that single statement there gives us something to think about in terms of what kind of knowledge Krishna is talking about in this section. You follow? It, it gives you something specific to look at. We have the generic idea of what Krishna means when he says knowledge, as he's been teaching us for four chapters. But then when you look at a specific section, you look for one or two words or one half a shlok, and Krishna will give you something else that will give you a sense of what he's trying to communicate in that precise moment. Did you follow that? But we'll come back to that. What I want to focus on before that is I want to focus on the idea that you have the ability to purify yourself to an unlimited degree and restore yourself to the Garden of Eden even today, because you have innately within you the ability to cultivate transcendental knowledge which washes you clean, helps you navigate to the other side of an unnavigable on your own ocean. It conveys you the same way a boat does miraculously across a body of water you could never cross. Boats are miracles. You would never be able to cross the ocean. But then a boat, you cross the ocean. It's, it's unbelievable what you can do with a boat. It's amazing what a boat can do. And so, Krishna's trying to convey to us how special knowledge is. It's not just something you have that you might use, you might not use, but it's this sacred escape hatch, this sacred save, this sacred get out of jail free card, this sacred like fix everything. You may not get out of jail, you may be in jail the rest of your life, but this kingdom is within. The kingdom of God is within. You can find this within yourself in any circumstance. And you are no longer limited by your external circumstances. You have an unlimited ability to grow. You follow? It's such an endorsement of knowledge. Krishna's never in the Gita up till this point or subsequently will he glorify knowledge in quite this way. That's why this chapter is called Jnana Yoga. Many chapters deal with Jnana Yoga. But this chapter is called Jnana Yoga. Why? Because Lord Krishna mentions Jnana and Jnana Yoga so many times in the Gita. So many other chapters. Maybe even more than in this chapter. He glorifies it so much in this chapter. 
And we should find this to be encouraging. And we should look at knowledge as being something very, very special and sacred that we should cultivate. And it's interesting because in some ways, it's like the possession of that knowledge transforms you like a virus. It infects you and you can't see the world the way you used to. And they've always experienced this. They know too much. And they know that the mirage is a mirage and they don't run after it like people run after it who think it's still an oasis. They know it's a mirage. So the knowledge itself has this viral effect on you that goes beyond your ability to control. It's so precious and sacred and transformational. Then there's also this idea of I'm going to cultivate this knowledge by thinking about and meditating on deeper truths. Then there's the idea that I need to practice this knowledge. I'm cultivating it, but I'm also putting it into practice in my life. I am acting as one acts who is in knowledge. I was talking to some friends today. One of them was dealing with depression. It was a couple. I made the point, you cannot ask someone not to be depressed. It's just, you can't do it. You can't say, don't be depressed. It's bumming me out. It's like, it doesn't work like that. Depression doesn't work like that. You can, however, say, I need a behavioral modification. We have a relationship. We depend on each other for stuff. When I'm feeling depressed, I still go out and do my duty. You have to do your duty. We have a relationship which requires both of us to do our duty because we're partners in this. And so I need a behavior modification out of you. You can be depressed, but you have to also ask me how I'm doing after a long day at work. You have to also do your fair share of the work around the house. You also have to go out and earn. You don't just get to, on the basis that you're depressed, completely collapse and do nothing because that's not a tenable relationship. But I'm not going to focus on telling you you can't be depressed. I'm going to focus on asking you to modify your behavior. Because that is something that's wondering about. Even if you're going through a hard time, you can still be considerate. You don't have to turn into an animal, a selfish animal who just thinks of itself and nobody else. You don't have to be blinded. You can fight that depression with a sense of duty, with a sense of obligation. Maybe every day you don't win, but you can win more days than you lose. And actually, by not thinking about yourself and thinking about others, you pull yourself out of depression. That's been demonstrated. It's been demonstrated. Focusing on others pulls you out of depression. And the more you focus on yourself, the more neurotic you get. Which everybody kind of knows anyway, but there's also, there's also studies which have been done. It's in the literature at this point. It's a cure. So, on one hand, knowledge is this viral thing that just infects you. and You come across these great ideas and your life's never the same. But then you can also participate with that knowledge. And you can cultivate it as a meditational thing, as, a, as something that you s sit with and spend time with. Then you can also put that knowledge into practice. You can ask yourself, if I was in knowledge, how would I behave? And then you can behave in that way. And now you're behaving as someone in knowledge, even though it's not really natural for you. You know enough to be able to contemplate and quantify that knowledge and consider what would someone in knowledge do and then you can model that and act as if you were in knowledge even though that knowledge is merely theoretical and you can experiment with acting as one who has knowledge even though your grasp of that knowledge is still largely theoretical and it has not become fused into your very existence. So now you have three levels. Level one, I encounter this idea and like a virus, presto changeo, in 10 years, I'm a pure devotee. And by itself, there is some truth to that, but it's not the entire picture. Then there's I can cultivate knowledge and spend time encountering great ideas and studying, and that will have a deeper effect on me. Then I can start to just put it into practice even before it's natural. And then the fruit of all those things happens and that knowledge becomes alive.
And that's a fourth state that's comprised of the previous three states of encountering a great idea, of cultivating that great idea, and then practicing that great idea. And those three things together are the ways in which we interface with knowledge. And that's what purifies you. Shradhava labate jnanam tatpara samyatendriyaha A faithful person gains knowledge by being dedicated to supreme and controlling his senses. Yanam Labdva. Now he has already achieved, having achieved that knowledge. So the first one is he achieves that knowledge, and then the second half of the verse it's it's having achieved that knowledge. So Yanam Labate, he achieves that knowledge, and then Yanam Labdva. Having achieved that knowledge, Param Shantim Achirena Adigachi, he goes to, he acquires supreme peace very quickly. He achieves supreme peace very quickly. So, this knowledge gives you self realization, but it comes at a cost. You have to control your senses. You have to be dedicated to supreme. So controlling your senses, that's acting as if you had knowledge. Being dedicated to supreme, that's cultivating the knowledge. And then the, and then the viral ideas are just reading the pages of the Gita, you get the viral ideas. Did you guys see what just happened? I just found within the next text the exact model that I gave you guys for the ways in which you should interface with knowledge. Therefore, it was not merely my idea. It's actually Krishna's desire given in the text. You want to hear an even more wild one? I didn't know that when I gave you the model. I just came up with it on my own. And then, lo and behold, the next verse had it. I'm as surprised as you guys are. I'm like, wow, I'm good at this. (laughs) (laughs) The element of faith has been added in, which is another interesting idea that, you know, that... um, uh, what is it? Uh, it's Augustine made a statement. Uh, uh, St. Augustine talked about the prerequisite of interest in the acquisition of knowledge. You have to be interested in something enough that you do the experiment and find out if it's true or not. Because there's no prerequisite interest, excitement, curiosity. Then there'd be nothing to get you out of your chair in the laboratory doing the experiment. Uh, it's, the, it's the requirement of will in the acquisition of knowledge. You have to have some will, some desire. I'm saying that faith is that desire. It's the willingness to cultivate that knowledge. It's the willingness to practice that knowledge. It fuels both pursuits. You encounter a great idea. You wouldn't encounter it if you didn't study. So that already means you have some interest. Then you cultivate that knowledge. You cultivate it. Tatpara, you're dedicated to it. That's a further level of commitment from you. And then samyata indriya, you control your senses. And that's another level of interest. You're actually slowing down your materialism to make space for this knowledge to take hold in you. Just having read the Gita means you're curious. Cultivating that knowledge means you're dedicated to Supreme. Controlling your senses means you're putting into practice. What would someone who was in knowledge do? I'm going to do that even though I'm not quite there yet. Those things, achirena adigachati param shantim, they lead you to Supreme Peace very quickly. Achirena. Achirena means with great time. Achirena means not after great time. Very quickly. Adigachati. He goes to what? Param Shantim. That supreme knowledge. Why? Because he's tatpara. He's dedicated to it. Samyata Indra. He's controlled his senses. He's cultivated knowledge and he's practicing it. But all three stages require faith. They require some will, some curiosity, some interest. Otherwise, you wouldn't have read the Gita and counted a great idea that can get, get, get viral with you. 
You wouldn't cultivate that great idea, increasing your chances of it going viral, and you wouldn't control your senses and act as someone. You can think about this like going viral on, online, on social. If you don't make content, you're not going to go viral. You've got to make some content. Right? You have enough interest that you make some content. You get it? Right? Now you got to make content. And then you got to make good content. <laughs> it's not that you just remain an ignorant fool, but if you're trying to make good content, you're going to study, you're going to get good at what you do, you're going to practice your craft, you're going you're gonna to put some time into it. You're not just going to turn on a camera and video yourself watching TV and eating potato chips. Or playing video games like a loser. The only people who watch, if you, people will watch you play video games, but they'll watch you play video games if you're really good at it. And so you got to put some time in. So if you want to go viral, you got to put some content up. That's reading some text and letting the idea soak into you. But then you also got to cultivate it. You got to cultivate it. And that means you got to, I'm trying to work with this metaphor. We'll see how far I get with it. That means you, you, you go and you study your craft and you get good at it. And that getting good at it means you spend time reading other people who are in the same field and you spend time actually working at your craft. Then you can go viral because you're putting out content, you're studying what good content looks like, you're getting better at what you do, and you're getting better at what you do by acquiring knowledge about it, theoretically, um, uh, cognitively, and then behaviorally. There's a cognitive aspect, that's your dedicated supreme, you're studying the content, you value it, you're looking at it, you're learning about it, and there's a behavioral aspect, I'm actually making stuff and performing the acts and putting it into practice, a cognitive and behavioral aspect. But all those things require some interest in going viral. All these things require some interest in what is that knowledge. I'm curious, what is that knowledge? And so faith is a requirement. Not blind faith, interest, will, the willful moving towards a goal. And you're moving, if you're moving towards that goal, you're moving away from other goals. That's another factor. See how that works? And therefore you have to control your senses. It's not because we're Victorian or we're anti-gay or something like that or we're just, you know, anti-having a good time. It's, 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 it's because we actually want people to have the energy to really put in good quality repetitions of spiritual life. And if you're half drunk and half stoned and blitzed out of your mind on orgasming without any self-restraint, you're just not going to have the depth and the clarity and the peacefulness to process and assimilate and learn. You're going to be too high on your own supply and you won't be able to pay attention. Sometimes I'm stunned by your guys' inability to pay attention. I'll literally say, two plus two equals four. What's two plus two equals four? You guys will be like... And I'm just like... <laughs> I don't say two plus two equals four, but I do the same thing with ideas. I, I make the same simple, simple formulas with ideas. Um, all right. Now we go back and we think about for a moment we think about what is this knowledge Krishna is talking about and he says it's the knowledge by which you see all beings in me and all beings in yourself it sounds a little impersonal like everybody's God but not really because he makes a distinction we see all beings in yourself and all beings in me so he makes a distinction between you and him and that distinction is made all throughout the Gita. And Krishna, as the creator of the universe, is distinct from us, if only in that he created the universe and we're part of it. There may be many other distinctions, but that's one that we can be sure of already. So, what does it mean that you see all people within you 
and you see all people within God. What does it mean? It's a deep idea. We're going to finish because I just realized we're over time. I completely lost track of time. I've been enjoying this class. And so I completely lost track of time. Um, but I want to at least give you something to think about. And so empathy is the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and think about how you would look at the world if it was you. Empathy is the birthplace of compassion. Compassion is this amazing. Compassion is love for someone who's suffering. You take love and then you combine love with someone who's suffering and it manifests as compassion. But compassion is miraculous because you can take a person you have no relationship with, that you have no reason to love, and if they're suffering and you're a deep soul, you can feel compassion for them. And so it enables you to love someone you don't even know. You normally have to fall in love and cultivate love and earn trust and it takes time. But compassion is different. Compassion, it can happen so quickly. You fall into a deep state of compassion with somebody, naturally. Why? Because they're suffering. Why? Because you can see and empathize with their pain and imagine how you would feel if you went through that and you would want someone to come and help you and so you go and be that change you want to see in others. You go and be that, you make that difference in somebody's life just because you can. This is a very practical way in which you can look at the rest of the world and you can see it as being within you in the sense that we're all human beings, we're all spirit souls, we all have pain, we all have sadness, we all deserve comfort, we all deserve compassion, we all deserve love, we all deserve somebody to have some faith in us, to invest in us, to see the good in us. If somebody did that for me, I want to do that for somebody else. The reason I do it is just because I can. Somebody did it for me just because they could. I want to pay it forward. I want to do it for somebody else. These are very practical ways we can take this esoteric idea. Also, that we're all children of God, that we all come from the same place, that we're all spiritual beings. There's many that, that we have, everyone has the right to this transcendental knowledge and should therefore be introduced to it. And then we see things in Krishna. We see the world through a Krishna conscious lens. We're conscious of Krishna and how Krishna is in the hearts of all. Therefore, we don't kill animals indiscriminately. We don't hurt people. We're not cruel. We don't lie. We don't cheat. Because we feel like we're always in the presence of Krishna. And that we're always talking to Krishna's children. And how we treat them is reflective of how we feel about their father, their mother, their creator, their friend. Krishna is ultimately the friend of all living entities. And therefore, we treat other people as, as, as friends of Krishna who have been brought into our life by Krishna, by the will of providence to teach us some lesson. We can go bigger. We're made of the same spiritual substance as Krishna and so is everybody else. We're all eternal beings. We're all sparks of that flame. Krishna might be the flame. He might be qualitatively you know, uh, quantitatively bigger than us, but qualitatively we're all the same. We're all sparks of that flame. In this way you can look at these verses and they, they, they provide powerful, a powerful springboard for meditation. A powerful springboard for deepening the way you look at the world. A powerful springboard for seeing other spiritual practices. That was what we were just talking about five verses ago, ten verses ago. Other spiritual practices and how in their own way, those people are also reaching out to the divine, trying to connect with divinity. I can see how they're also doing the same thing I'm doing, but in their own way. But now that I just say it's all the same, I can just, oh, those people are just giving things. But these people are actually cultivating knowledge. Those people are more my brethren. These people are more on the external. We can still do a comparative analysis based on the criteria Krishna gave for how to judge, but it's a very, very non-sectarian criteria. Are you guys following this? I'm running with this stuff quick. This could be a whole other class. Maybe it will be. Maybe that's what we'll do next week. But these are some 
ways in which we can get more specific digging into that half a verse where Krishna told us the result of the kind of knowledge he was talking about and gave us some sense of what the goal is above and beyond doing your duty and not being attached to the result. Okay, we're done. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. 